But um, also, Richard had mentioned, you know, he's, he's good about kidding people, isn't he? You know, he, what a great friend. You know, I mentioned, he mentioned uh, about a post that I made about, you know, Cleveland, you know, the, uh, they have Johnny Football. You know, that's one of the biggest names in college football. If you mention Johnny Football, Johnny is, and you can name anything. And then he's there in Cleveland, and King James came back here lately, and they also have the Republican National Convention that's coming there in 2016. So he mentioned two out of three is not bad. I think I know which one he's talking about. And also, you know, Brother David Reed was mentioned about, you know, I mentioned about King James. You know, that's who they called LeBron. Okay, they call him the king there because uh, he's a great basketball player. And, and David Reed mentioned, he goes, at least Cleveland went with King James and not the new international version. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1. You know, one of, one of the things we're looking at here in Philippians, the Word of God has many, for many of us, know it is laid out in a twofold purpose. And already this week, you have, you know, this weekend, you learn about renewing your mind. You learn about twofold mysteries, a purpose, a mystery, uh, and a prophecy. You learn about your Bible. You learn about Jesus being a dispensationalist. That's very, very important stuff for basic information. But we also know that the Bible is laid out in a twofold purpose and prophecy program, which is focused on the earth, and the mystery program, which is focused in the heaven. We also acknowledge within that twofold purpose that's a threefold division, don't we? The ones that we can understand the Bible. Times past, over here, but now and ages to come. You know, the Philippian church, our study this morning is about the Philippian church, and it's not located in the books of times past, is it? It's not located in the books of ages to come. It's located in the books of but now between Romans and Philemon. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16 and 17, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you. All scriptures are given by inspiration of who? God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For what? For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into what? All good works. So in order for the body of Christ to get profit out of those scriptures, we must go to the books of time past, right? I'm testing you guys this morning a little bit. You know, you had a great night's sleep. You got to get energized here. No, we look at the books of, uh, through Romans through Philemon. Romans is the first book of doctrine, is it not, that we believe to be truth for us. It's profited. Do you get profit in justification and sanctification and glorification and dispensation and also in application? The next book after Romans is the book of what? Corinthians, isn't it? It's a book of reproofing. And Paul was reproofing the behavior because it was not practicing the right doctrine. And it exposed their faults, what it did. The book, next book is the book of Galatians. It's a book of correction. Paul was correcting their behavior. They was going towards wrong doctrine. And that correction actually uh, exposes error. It, well, excuse me, it counters the error. The next you have the book of Ephesians, don't you? It's another book of doctrine. It's about advanced mystery truths in our standing and our state. Next you find the book of Philippians. It's a book of reproof. It's another book of reproof, and that's what we're going to look at this week. It's Paul is reproofing their thinking that Christ is our purpose, Christ is the pattern, Christ is our prize, and Christ is our provision. Then you have the book of Colossians. Colossians, Paul is correcting their thinking. They wasn't holding the head of Christ, and they were slipping away from other foundations of the doctrine. And then you got the book of Thessalonians. And you can use that as instructions and doctrine and reproof and correction. That's very important information in it to know and to understand what God is doing for us in the body of Christ. I'll give you a little history about the Philippian church. They had a very special relationship to Paul. They had never been, he had never, it's never been hurt with distrust or defaults like some other churches he was associated with. They bought into his laboring in the ministry's sake and, and sent him support. They made Paul's afflictions and affections their own. and He called them, what, his beloved. 
It's very important to understand that. And we also know that the church had the proper order of the leadership with the bishops and deacons. No indication of moral failure or wrong doctrine that many others were falling to like the Galatians. You know, they got, got away. The epistle has a fourfold presentation. And it will be expressed in certain verses this week that we'll cover. Today we're going to be covering our, my verses uh, for me to live. In Christ, is Christ and to die is gain. On, on Tuesday morning, Brother Charlie is going to be Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. Wednesday is Brother Ron. He'll be t- talking about Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him. And then uh, Thursday, Brother Kenny will bring on uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. As we go through this study this week, I trust that you'll see a progression and a completion in Christ as we build on each one of these. It's it's very important. Philippians chapter 1. Let's read. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer of my, for, of my for you, all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that, this, that which, he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meek for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, insomuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how, how greatly I long after you, all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, and to the glory and praise of God. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the fathers of the gospel, so that, that my bonds... In Christ may, are manifest in all palace and all in all other places, and many of you, of the brethren of the Lord wax in confidence by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one uh, preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing... I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to me to gain. Excuse me, to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I will not. For I am in straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having confidence, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of the faith. And that your rejoicing may be more abundantly in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together 
for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he has saw in me, and now here, now to be in me. Father, we do thank you for the grace you've given us. We thank you for this chapter of the Philippians that we can make and understand we have life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At least 24 times in this chapter alone, Paul mentions God or Jesus Christ in that chapter. He has a lot to say about that. So when we work through the chapter this morning, we have, there's great truths that Paul wants us to know about Christ being our purpose in our life. One of the first things that he, that he makes mention in the first seven verses is the fellowship in the gospel. Notice it's in the gospel. And that end denotes presence or enclosed or surrounded by limits. Paul knew that saints there in Philippians was living a, a great example of what fellowship should be. And he says it from the first day until now. They got, they got true companionship that was needed in that local church. He says, I thank my God and making requests known with joy. Paul was confident in the Philippians that they was going to continue in the gospel and they was going to continue with him. They brought into his message and supported the messenger. You know, when you find true fellowship in the gospel, no matter where you're at, you can rejoice in the fact that there's truth there, can't you? You know, I myself can rejoice in the fact that there's truth in Connecticut and California and where, el where else they may be. Because why? You're in the gospel. You know, some people today, they just don't know what that fellowship means and they, want, they yearn for fellowship, but they're willing to sacrifice the gospel to f satisfy their flesh of going out to, with other denominations. Can you fellowship with other denominations? Can you truly fellowship? Why don't you just call it what it is? Let's just go out to eat. You know, that type of thing. Let's go bowling. You know, that's, that's not... You, you, I guess you could say that's fellowship, but it's not in the gospel. It's very important to be in the gospel. And I know people, and you do too, have bought into this truth of the gospel. They fellowship not only locally, but across lines, and they had bailed out long before they come to this book of Philippians. You know, when you talk about reproof and correction, doctrine, reproof and correction, it's very important. And you listen here to this week on the things that's being said because it's basic. And sometimes we get away from the basics of what we need to be doing and we want to go out and find out other things. We, some, of, some of us out there want to preach things that Paul didn't even preach. You know, and they get away. They get away. And so you've got you to reprove their thinking. You've got to correct their thinking. You help the brothers get in line. But if they choose not to, what do you do? You don't stop. You just keep pressing towards the mark. And they would only allow, if they would only allow the progression of the book of Philippians, uh, or like I just shared, doctrine, reproof, and correction to work in their way that God sent for them, it would make a difference in their inner man. That's where it starts, isn't it? In the inner man. Next we find in the chapter, in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 8, you'll, you'll find that uh, Christ's filled life, the purpose, is that we can have feelings of Christ. Verse 8 says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. You know what that bowels of Jesus Christ is? The inner workings of the heart, of the flexions, that, and it become the very part of Paul's life. That's the inner man, isn't it? The bowels, what, you know, where you feel things. You know, I get, we get excited and our emotions make some, you know, sometimes we get too excited that our emotions make decisions that we regret later on. You know, Northeast Ohio, as I shared earlier, is excited right now. It's booming. And they think that's life, what's going on there. But they don't know what real life is. He mentions in verse 7 of uh, uh, Philippians, Even as it is meek for me to think of this of you, because I have you in my heart. Okay? It's a heart issue. Go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. See that? From the what? Heart. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. And get Romans chapter 6. And keep your hand on Philippians. Philippians cha- uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 sh- says, Speaking to yourself in psalms and heal- hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. It's a heart issue. It's, it's the bowels of, God, of Jesus Christ, what He wants us to do. Um, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Those doctrinal truths are set up in Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. You don't have to go nowhere else. You can get it right there. And it's, one can say that the heart, Christ's heart had become Paul's heart as you study this. And it replaces, go back to Philippians, and it replaces the old heart of Paul. It replaced the one he had, and it was beating a new heart. For the Philippians. He loved the Philippians. You know, many of you love your local church, which you should. But you also love, you love coming here, don't you? You love supporting Grace School of Bible. You love supporting your own ministry. You love that type of thing. You, you love that. Your heart is different. The, the love for the heart was the feelings that Paul had towards the saints. They were his beloved. That's, that's nice, isn't it? Isn't it nice to be loved? Many of you are going like this. Many of you are like that. No. It's nice to be loved. It really is. And you think about the very heart of Christ working in Paul being displayed in that chapter. And we can feel the same beating in that chapter, can't we? We can feel the same love that Paul had for the Philippians. And it was beating a, a new beat. That thump, 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 thump. We should feel the same thing Paul felt. Because why? We're in Christ, aren't we? Next thing we look in Philippians chapter 1 is if Christ is our purpose, and He should be, we should have the same interests of Christ, shouldn't we? In verses 12 through 18 that we read, 12 through 18, I'm not going to reread it, but you could, what we did read, it, the things that Paul talked about him that happened in prison and happened to him personally, you know, as far as being in prison, treated unjustly, and many other things that would make a man just hate life. If I went through things that Paul went through, I would probably give up as a, as in myself. Many of us go through things right now that Paul went through in his life. And we can understand what he went through, and we have instructions how we can overcome that. But the one thing that Paul knew was Christ was his life, and, and, that was, and it was life within life. And he mentions in verse 12, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things that happened unto me had fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Towards the end, his rejoice was that Christ preached, wasn't it? He didn't, you know, it wasn't so much he was in prison, oh, woe woe is me. He rejoiced that no matter what, it's his gospel, the gospel of Christ is getting out there. Paul knew his personal desires and even the pain that was placed upon him was set aside when it became became Christ's interest. Think about that Christ's life inside of your, your life. Shouldn't it change your purpose? His life inside of your life? You think of a child being conceived in a womb I mean, inside of a woman. That's, isn't that life inside of life? And, that, and then, I wouldn't know what experienced that, but I, 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 you know, my wife now had babies and all, and I, I couldn't understand that. There was life growing inside her. And that child is a part of her, and her a part of that life. Paul builds us up with this as before. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We have life. 
Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up in the, uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Romans chapter 8. Some of these verses have already been touched on. You, you can't help it. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of life because of what? Righteousness. It's spirit of life. It's God's life. Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. Always bearing about in the body of, of dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our own body. You have the life of Christ. His interest should be your interest. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of, of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That baby inside that, in, inside that, it was life inside of life, isn't it? And Christ's life inside of our life. Think about that. You think about Paul was in the, not was the only was he in the prison, but what he, what, where was he at when he wrote this, when he, when he got the, uh, the jailer saved? Inside the prison, wasn't he? He was inside the prison. So when Christ's life is inside your life, it should make a difference. It's life. It's not dead. It makes a, it's making a difference in my life. I know it, it, it's taken over 20 years of dispensational truth to you know, make a difference, but... Hey, I'm learning. I'm learning every day. Amen. You know, and, and you know, this marks 10 years of uh, uh, when I graduated from Grace School of Bible. So I'm, I'm slowly catching up with some of you guys. You know, but 20-some years we was introduced to this message, and it's, ha- it's become life for us. Brother Ted and I talk all the time about some things that goes on in our local ministry, and we, well, many of us do, and things, people just don't know what that life is, do they? It's, it's life. The fourth thing is a purpose back in Philippians. You can keep your fingers there and, well, go back to Philippians chapter 1. The fourth thing of, uh, of what we're looking at, Christ's, our purpose is a life, is that the, the Spirit of Christ is imparted in the believer. Verse 19 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't stop thinking about the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not the little S, is it? That's the big S. That's the big Spirit. And it's, and it's not the Spirit in Jesus Christ, but it's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He's given it to us in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But if you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so by, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See the big Spirit? You're a part of that. And God Almighty, through His Son Jesus Christ, has imparted the Spirit of Christ in us. He supplies that in us. Galatians chapter Four. I don't know if I've said this before, but I'll say it again and probably said it two or three times. You see the progression here that you learned from the doctrine and re- reproof and correction from the other books till you get to Philippians? It builds. And when you get to Philippians, you can understand who you are. And, it, it, you know, it's exciting. It really is. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 6, and because, well, look at verse uh, 
4. But when the fullness of the times was come, God sent his, forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem, redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son unto your hearts crying, Abba, Father. By allowing the Holy Spirit to supply us, we can know his own motives and purpose and make it ours, can we? We don't have to speculate. We don't have to close our eyes and, and dream. We have his word to tell us that what his motives, what Jesus Christ's motives are. And it should be our life. The next thing that follows when Christ is the believer's purpose is that Christ himself becomes the believer's main importance. Main importance. Now, I like baseball. I like football. Many of you do too. And we put a lot of emphasis on that, don't we? It's, it, it, is, it is important to many of us. You know, some people put golf and, you know, you know I had to mention that. They, they call that a sport. I don't, I don't, <laughs> to me it's just leisure time. But, you know, the thing of main importance, and in the coming weeks where we're at Northeast Ohio, not only will you have the Br Brigstone Invitational, where they have all the world golf people there, you also have um, a Pro Football Hall of Fame where they're going to induct into their temple of gods, you know, and, and everything's happening there, you know, and it's just right around our doorstep. And, and, it's, and it's just, you know, that's an importance to people. And one of the things I find out what works for me is the fact that if I don't know you and if I'm with you, I want to find out what's important for you as far as who do you think Jesus Christ was or where are you going to spend eternity and let them tell me. And then I know where you go. I know where to bridge off of. And I think that's what Paul did in Acts 17 when he went to Berea and Thessalonians and Athens. When he came to Athens, could he tell him who Jesus Christ was right off the bat when they worshiped rocks? He had to take them back to Genesis. So it's very important to know their importance, where they're at, and you can go, okay, I'm springboarding on that. You know who Jesus Christ is? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? And I asked them this. And I asked them about what they trust. So it's because it, you know when that happens, you can see, okay, he don't know the gospel. And then when they say they trust Christ died for your sins and buried rose, rose again, you could say, plus anything else? <laughs> you know, you need to say that because chances are they may add something. But it's, it's glory when you hear somebody say, there's nothing else I can do. You know, you're a total stranger on the side of the road you're talking that to. That's, that's beautiful. That's the gospel. That's the gospel truth. But uh, what we can, uh, you know, we can and we'll give other, you know what we'll do? The main importance, we will we'll give up friends because of life. We can and we will because of life. We'll give up wealth because of life. You know what I'm saying? If you could live and want to live eternally or if you want to live physically forever, won't you give up some things? I'll write you a check right now if I don't have to go through you, what you're going to go through, you know, in, in weeks to come. You know, people have surgery and stuff. Wouldn't you rather just write a check and say, hey, I don't want to go through this. But everything else pertaining to such, but not life itself. You don't want to give up life. We want to live. You ever, I, well, I've seen dead people. I've had, had dead people in my arms trying to give them CPR. And in your last gasp, and you're like, He's going to make it, and he don't make it. You know, and you're like, whoa. You know, you don't have the power of life, but, but it's important. And those people that died would just give anything for that. You know, we have life right now. You know, I, I think about the things that we live, and you heard this many, many times before. We live in the greatest time of our lives, don't we? Now, many of you can remember working in tobacco patches or, you know, things like that as a kid growing up and seeing milking cows and doing things like that. Would you want to go back to that time? Would you want to go back and live in a log cabin with cracks in it that deep and you stuff a uh, newspaper in there to keep the heat out? No, keep the heat in. 
No, that's not life. You know, we're living in the greatest times on earth, especially with this electronic age. You notice that? Click of a button, boom. Somebody's done quoted you 15 times. You know, and you're like, whoa, I didn't really even say that. But it's, it's life. It's supreme possession. You want to live, don't you? You don't want to die. So because Christ is a very life in the believer, excuse me, he is our main possession and concern. This, again, we find in the first chapter of Philippians. Go back to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but but that with all boldness and always. So now also Christ should be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death or by death. Paul's one concern is that Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death. Should that not be our concern as well? Should we not want to live if you're, if you're laying on that operating table? Shouldn't you want to be a continued witness of Jesus Christ? What in the world are they going to do to you, <laughs> you know, that's going to upset you? It shouldn't be nothing because, you know, we want to apply that to our own bodies. You say, go ahead and do whatever you want to or doctor, or uh, insurance man, or come take my house, that type of thing. I've got life in Christ. I really do. Go back to, um, we learned that, go to Romans chapter 6. We learned this doctrine back in Romans. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, 7, 8 deals with what? Sanctification, doesn't it? It deals with setting yourself apart. And shouldn't we want to set ourselves apart? We should. Verse 13. Neither yield uh, yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that uh, that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of the flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so now yield your members ser- to servants unto holiness. Chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good, that is good, and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's important to God, isn't it? If it's important to God, shouldn't it be important to us? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are of God's. You know you're not yourself anymore? You know that's why you can call him Lord? He bought you. If you trust that he died for your sins and buried and rose again. Now, some heathen, he don't know that, does he? But when the Lord paid that ultimate price for us by the blood of Jesus Christ, he is Lord. He had bought you. You're not yourself anymore. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, in the past, I've been known to have one of the fastest morning messages on record. And I purpose in my heart this morning, I'm just going to take my time with you guys. Because I, I only get to see you once, twice a year. I really do. And I enjoy seeing you. Get to know you. I want a fellowship in the gospel. We're going to spend eternity together, aren't we? We really are. Second, uh, uh, what did I say? Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. 
verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because that we thus judge that if one died for all, then we all are d- dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that which died for them and rose again. We tell our kids all the time, don't do it because you want to please mom and dad. You do it because you want to please the one who died for you. That's what you want to do. And you tell them that since it's that, that big. And when they get uh, us, uh, will they make mistakes? Yes. Yes. Will they call mom and dad? Yes. You know, do you want that to happen? No. You know, we're totally empty nest. And we're really struggling to find somebody to say, do this, do that. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I encourage you if you're out in the Ohio area and you want to come and visit for a couple of days and you got, now don't bring your dogs. I got a dog. I'm talking about kids. But anyway, it took us, our kids to leave to get a dog. I'm thinking, wait a minute. We just, that animal's tying us down. You ever notice that? But people do that. People do the strangest thing. But uh, Christ becomes Paul's purpose in life or death, doesn't it? Go back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. But I am straight betwixt two, having the desire to depart and to, to be with Christ, which is far better. Aren't we like that? We know in our hearts and our mind right now, it is far better to be with Christ, isn't it? You know, I think of Brother Ray Watson. He's there now, you know, and many other people that we know. They're already there. They don't have to look for that bless of hope. They're there. And I'm thinking, I'd much rather be there too, but I don't want to leave my wife. Or I don't want to leave my job. Yeah, right. But you know, but the thing is, you know, it, there's, you know, you just don't, you want to, you want to depart from some things, don't you? I much far better we be retired than you know have to drive that truck. You know, many of you know I'm still a special commodities relocation engineer, and I've been that way for a long, long time. I, it don't, it don't seem like it, it's going to change, because I, I, you know, I said to myself, I'm going to be working the rest of my life. I really am. I'm going to be ready. You know, and preaching really pays, doesn't it, guys? <laughs> you know, they got a they got a retirement plan in all this world, I guess. But anyway, think about this. You know, do we have the same desires to say life or death in Christ will be our purpose? Can we? When Christ is our purpose, it will affect our walk and conduct. And our, we walk worthy of our vocation where we're in, he had called us. Look at verse 27. Our conversation... Uh, let, uh, let, our, let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together the, uh, uh, for the faith of the gospel. Now, where do you think they want, uh, got those ones at? The one spirit, the one mind. I'm glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. They learn it from the doctrine. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is three bodies. There are 19 spirits. No, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, in, the, uh, in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of us all, who is, uh, who is above all and through all and in all. That's where he got, they got those ones at. And he's, re- he's reproofing their thinking and say, hey, remember this. You've got one spirit, one mind. Go back to uh, Philippians verse 28. And in nothing terrify by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but unto you, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Where do you think they saw that in Paul? 
Would inside the jail ring a bell? When the earthquake came and the jailer started, was going to take his life, wasn't he? But Paul, where's Paul? Running for the door? No. He stood there knowing who he was in Christ. We're all here. And the man got saved that day. And his whole household, by the way. If Christ be our purpose, he will express himself in a way we live and nothing should terrify us, silly. We talk about people departing from the faith all the time. We talk about people that leave our local church because of, you know, they didn't like my hair color that day. You know, I had a beard one day and now I don't. You know, they didn't like, I didn't polish my shoes. You know, just, just immature stuff. You know, and they leave. And so much you just want to grab them and say, whoa, don't go nowhere. Just stay. Maintain. But they won't. And you let them go. And you let them go. You know, you just let them go. And you be kind to them. You leave the door open. And they'll come back in their own time. When they come back, you just greet them as a saint. Because if, they, if you know they're saved, they're saved, aren't they? You know, then they got a maturity problem or, or a Corinthian problem or a Galatian problem. But they don't have a Philippian problem. That's where we should be in our maturity. Galatians chapter 2 says, you know, we read this verse a while ago. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Christ in us and through us is a progression of the doctrine that has been building since we got saved. It works if you allow it to work. I love the fact that the way God laid this book out, and if if you're starting a ministry and you're working through a ministry and you start in the book of Romans and you learn how Paul learned and you build upon what Paul built, through God, God through Paul built, and it builds a building block and it stabilizes you. And you don't have to be moved. You don't have to be tossed to and fro with every winds of doctrine. Our identity change. Our heart change. Our concerns change. Our interests change. Our life change and should become that of Christ. His life in us and through us should make the difference in whomever we may come in contact with, shouldn't it? Because a lot of people don't know who you are, same as we don't know who they are. Whether they be friend or foe, we believers should exhort the faith to others by standing in one spirit and one soul and one body. You know, a lot of things happen to us in the ministry, whether you're young or old, and you just don't understand. But isn't it great that you can reach out to somebody that's that's been battle-tested, you know, and they look to you as battle-tested. So as you stand and make, make the difference in one spirit and one soul and one body, we have that life and I know our purpose in Christ can, uh, can understand that there's truth is his truth is our life. And this chapter that we just went through has set the groundwork for the other three chapters, but asks us to say to me to live is Christ. Father, we do thank you for the day. We thank you for so much for your son, Christ Jesus. And Lord, if there's one that's listening or here today that's never fully trusted in the bloodshed of your son, for the payment of sins. Let them do so today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.